Please help spread the message of Frequency Specific Microcurrent by clicking on the like button. You can subscribe to us on YouTube or any podcast app. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. You can find the podcast transcription at FrequencySpecific.com, as well as more information about Frequency Specific Microcurrent. Hi there. It is, I'm early. We're a minute early. That never happens. Be aware of some sort of disturbance in the force. Kim is alive and well in Philadelphia, and she won't be home for a couple of days. We get to play just us, which means unless you want me to talk nonstop for 60 minutes, you guys feel free to ask questions. I don't have a theme for today, except maybe one, and that is the shared wisdom of the FSM community. I had an email from a practitioner who's been doing FSM since 1998, and her husband has trigeminal neuralgia in the ophthalmic branch and the maxillary branch, and they have tried everything. Nothing works. And for some reason, even though he's had multiple strokes before, it didn't occur to them that this trigeminal neuralgia could have been a stroke in the pond. Now, the reason I know it might have been a stroke in the ponds and made the suggestion that she try the frequencies for stroke in the ponds was because Mary Ellen Chalmers lectured on that kind of cause of trigeminal neuralgia at the advance. Is that just two weeks ago? Anyway, and the person who was texting me is a practitioner, and she is the reason that we know that tight psoas muscles are almost always from scarring in the ureter. And the reason we all know that scar causes the psoas to be tight is that she used that frequency scarring in the ureter on my psoas in 2002, four, in there someplace. And I've been using it ever since and teaching it to you ever since. And now everybody knows that an unreasonably tight and tender psoas is almost always scarring in the ureter. If you think about the concept of, have you heard the hundredth monkey uh, concept? So if you have a a tribe, and a new idea is introduced into the tribe, when enough people are doing the new thing, pretty soon the whole tribe somehow knows it. And that's, that's how everything is, seems to be working out. So this is Alice. Thank you, Alice. Just need to say that I'm in love with FSM. Yay. And Kim and me both. Yay. My mom's decades old bronchitis cough is healed by about 95%. We're also, we're treating our old kitty with kidney support. He gets in my husband's lap every morning for treatment. The animals absolutely love FSM. Isn't that amazing? The cats will climb up onto the microcurrent machine back when I used to treat with the blue box at home. The cats would climb on my lap if I was treating myself. And I'm glad mom's cough is getting better. It's irritation. And speaking of spreading the knowledge, Alice, would you share what you're running on the bronchitis cough? I have ideas. It's the bronchi, 64, and the trachea is pretty cough sensitive. And that's the tissues, 15. So is it histamine? Is it 
inflammation? Is it scar tissue? While Alice is figuring that out, Louise, thank you, Louise. When using wet towel, is it okay to attach the red and black clip to one towel? Nope. Red and green are positive. Black and yellow are negative. So you have to, the, that way the towel is treating itself. You have the red and green on one towel and the black and yellow on the other towel. You use two wet towels to separate the two channels. The frequencies from channel A and channel B blend in the patient. So you've got the red and green leads, just like we do at the practicum. You've got the red and green leads in a towel around the neck and the black and yellow leads in a towel on the chest, let's say if you're doing the supine cervical practicum. The lady I treated yesterday had her left hip replaced and came in with a pinch and pain in the hip joint when she tried to flex the hip. And what she pointed to was the lesser trochanter that's on the side in the back of the femur so that it's a and external rotator. I'll also get right back to you. And so treated, she's very athletic, has an active sort of life just because I know what she does for a living. And she's never had a kidney infection, never had kidney stones. But given her lifestyle, it's a pretty good chance that at some point in the last 20 years that her psoas has been tight, that she fell on her back. So I treated the psoas and being an athlete, her eyes got really big and we didn't even get the upper lip. It wasn't that, it was eyebrows. Did scarring in the ureters, scarring in the kidneys, sclerosis in the adipose to free up the psoas. And then got down to the lesser trochanter and ran torn and broken the flat tendons because that's where the so as attaches to the trochanter, maybe that was why it was sore. And I had asked her, beside your C-section, did you have any other surgeries and your hip replacement? So C-section and hip replacement. So I get down and I'm starting to work on the anterior hip where this pain is. And there's this big scar running down the length of her thigh, pretty much the, from the groin to the knee. I said, what's that scar from? I forgot about that. I'd lost 115 pounds and there was a bunch of loose skin. And that surgery on both legs and on my abdomen was to remove the loose skin. So if you're going to have that surgery leads to bleeding. So I asked her, was your thigh bruised? Because the scar went from her groin down almost to her knee. And she said, oh yeah, it was all bruised. So if you look underneath the scar, what's stuck? The femoral plexus, the fascia from the adductors, the artery, the vein, and the lymph, because her lower leg was swollen. Her upper leg was normal, but the lower leg was swollen. Now, why would the lower leg be swollen? If you think about it, if somebody is going to do surgery right at your pubic bone to take out the in from your abdomen, and then somebody is going to <clears throat> do surgery down your thighs from the groin to your knees, where did this run? If you remember, there's one or two pictures in the core and the advanced where you have in net or the, the lymph nodes that are in the groin and the lymphatic channels. If you create a lot of bleeding and right above the lymphatics, pretty good chance you're gonna have some scar tissue in the lymphatics. <clears throat> so we treated scarring in the nerve. She liked that because she stopped jumping inflammation on the nerve. Scarring in the lymphatics, scarring in the fascia, 
scarring in the arteries, scarring in the vein, and in the end, still hurt at the very end to lift her hip, but at least she could initiate movement. And so we went from the kidney clear down to her knee on the left, which is where the hip got replaced. And then on the right, the x-ray showed she had a bone spur where the psoas attaches to the lesser trochanter. You only have bone spurs when the muscles really tight and pulls on the periosteum for a really long time. So we worked on that psoas, we worked on the scar tissue on the right leg, and I will see her again Friday. So that's the peeling the onion concept and the, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you about that other surgery. That's after I've asked her three times. Any other surgeries? No. So there's that. Okay. So Louise, when I treated her, I had one towel underneath her low back with the red and green leads clips on it. And I had the black and yellow clips down on her left groin. And then I moved it down to the knee as I worked on the scar tissue between her wow. pubic bone and her knee. And then as we worked on the lymphatics the whole way, went down to her ankle to get rid of some of the swelling in her lower leg. So that's the story about the wet towels. Red and green at the top, black and yellow at the bottom. Uh, red and black are one channel. And if you put the red and the black on one towel, you're going to treat the towel. So red and green on one, black and yellow on the other. And usually red and green is proximal or at the spine. Black and yellow is distal. Okay. All right, Alice. Ran two programs on the custom care, just standard bronchitis and bronchial scarring. Only ran them twice. She called me two weeks after the first treatment to say she was shocked. The cough was almost gone. When you do the impossible, it really changes what you think about what's possible. I'll tell a story about that from this week, too, if I remember to do it. Mary. Eye problems for the last week, blepharitis, ocular rosacea. I don't treat the eye, but you need an ophthalmologist for blepharitis and ocular rosacea, not even an optometrist. You need somebody that can prescribe medication and you need to call them and you need to tell them that it's urgent. You're not one of those patients that can wait three months to get into an ophthalmologist. So maybe you have to go to your GP and get referred urgently. The immune system in the eye is the most aggressive in the body and most vision problems that are fo that follow inflammation or infection uh, are caused by the immune system reaction and the inflammation. Get thee to a doctor. This is not a place for FSM. Okay, Louise, yay. I remember now, bumblebee, Christmas tree, red cross, black. And yeah, using the uh, magnetic converter wants to integrate the wet towel. There's a place for each. I use the converter at night and I use wet towels in the daytime because I never know when I need to polarize something positive. Alice, I've only known about FSM for two years, accidentally from my frozen shoulder. And you're 51 and planning on going to massage school this spring. It's contagious, isn't it? Once you see it, it's hard to unsee it. Okay, Mary, yay. You've seen an ophthalmologist twice last week and you have all the meds. Okay, maybe vitamin C. I don't know what else you do for eye issues. Vitamin A, that helps. Okay, I got everybody. Okay. Here's one for you. Can you use more than one magnetic converter at the same time on multiple conditions? I don't see why not. I've never done it, but if you can use more than one custom care on multiple conditions at one time, I don't see why you can't use more than one converter. Sure. And if it doesn't work, be sure and call me or email me or 
something, let us know. Because you guys are the way we find out how everything works. I, I had a patient this week from Texas. She has a rare genetic condition called SP. She's heterozygous. It's a genetic condition where you can't put the proteins together that make nerves work. It affects the spinal cord, the nerves, and obviously centers in the brain. The symptoms are spasticity. So she's on baclofen and her legs were still really spastic. And then muscle weakness. Life expectancy is roughly the same, but they came in and stayed for two weeks in June or July of last year. Bought a custom care at the end of the two weeks because 81 and 10 worked, 81 and increased secretions in the spinal cord, reliable, took down the spasticity, then increased secretions in the pons, increased secretions in the cerebellum, increased secretions in the sensory motor cortex. And so she used her custom care a couple of times a day for six weeks. And then something happened to the motherboard, which is really rare. And they sent it in, had it repaired. We got it reprogrammed. She started using it. And they came back to see me this week because she said, it's not working. It's not the same as it was before I sent it in to get repaired. So even though the machine is working, confident because I'm not getting the same sort of relief I did. Allie says, eye bright is an eye herb. Not sure whether it will help Mary's condition, but can't hurt you. One of the nice thing about herbs is they're mild enough, most of them, that can't hurt, might help. And I've heard of eyebright, and I'm not much of an herbal guy. Anyway, back to this patient. And so the thing that we can try is let me try treating you and see if we can get you back to where you were when you left here last June or July. So at one machine, neck to feet, increased secretions in the spinal cord, then increased secretions in the pons, increased secretions in the cerebellum, increased secretions in the sensory motor cortex. And as I added machines, I found out that 81 and 10 increase the tone in her legs. So I turned that machine off and sure enough, everything got soft. I turned on increased descending inhibition in the spinal cord to relax spasticity and the tone in her legs tightened up. Now this was 6.30 at night. So now I'm texting Ben Catholi in Chicago he, because he knows what SPG7 is. You're going to have to look it up because I can't describe it, except that it's genetic condition and she's heterozygous. So she has one gene that works and one gene that doesn't. And obviously the gene that doesn't work is the one that's operating right now. So I use the sulfagio frequency for repairing DNA and the different tissues on channel B. So I'm texting Ben Catholi and he said, maybe you need the spinal thalamic tracks. It's a motor track in the spinal cord. And I did increase secretions in the spinal thalamic tract and that increased the tone, turned that off, everything got soft. And it made your brain hurt because this condition is supposed to affect the spinal cord. And as we are texting and treating and the hypothesis is, and Ben or Dr. Catholi put it very succinctly, maybe the problem moved north. And what I told the patient was, 
it's not the machine. They were concerned because they had their custom care repaired and maybe it's not working anymore. And after treating her, it's not the machine. You're different. It's treating the spinal cord makes it worse. And when I looked at her protocol that I'd written, I treated the brain parts first and then ran repair DNA in the spinal cord. And then I treated increased secretions in the brain parts and then treated increased secretions in the spinal cord. I made it better and then made it worse. The frequencies made it better when we worked in the brain. Then I treated the cord and it made it worse. Now, I can't say that I understand this because I don't. We're already doing something that is impossible. Like any change at all is not possible. We treat concussion in Vegas and then those protocols. So we brainstormed. I changed the protocol, took out everything for the spinal cord and sent her home for four weeks to see what happens. The other thing is if you're going to increase secretions that are descending inhibition, that quiet spasticity. Am I losing people here? Are you guys following me? Okay, you're with me. Got it. So if you're going to increase descending inhibition, if you're going to push neural pathways to secrete GABA to relax muscles, then you have to give the body the building blocks for GABA. That made sense. Well, she was already taking GABA. She forgot that I told her to take taurine, which goes with GABA. And so she's going to take taurine. And then she said, remember the part where we say, if you listen very carefully, the patient will tell you what's wrong with them. Then she said, my muscles don't just feel tight. They feel weak. What drives motor contraction? Centrally, it's dopamine. Peripherally, it's acetylcholine. So I put her on theanine and tyrosine. That's the part where you go back after you review molecules of behavior, I don't know, five or six times, then some of this will start to stick. Tyrosine and theanine, and I cheated. I looked up on my phone precursors to dopamine, tyrosine and theanine, and acetylcholine. She's already taking phosphatidylcholine to get her vagus nerve to work to get the autoimmune portion of this turned around. So we're going to try that for four to six weeks and see what happens. So the important part is, do you see the logic? If you're going to drive the brain to quiet spasticity, you have to give it the stable state. You have to give it the stuff that it needs, the Legos that it needs to create this thing that is called GABA. You have to give it the pieces. So GABA and taurine. And then if you're going to drive it to increase muscle contraction at the same time that you're getting it to reduce spasticity, you okay? You doing all right? Okay. Increase strength and contraction while reducing spasticity. That's dopamine and acetylcholine. Look up the pieces and parts that make dopamine and see what happened. Then Dr. Catholi said something that was really interesting. He said, because the genes can't make the proteins correctly, she has a bunch of neurotransmitters that are stuck. They're peptides that just are made wrong and they're they gunk up the pathway, the technical term. 
And I went, we have a frequency for protein accumulation. So I added to our custom care 120 from the advanced for abnormal proteins and protein accumulation. So all of that is a thought experiment. And we're in the position a lot of times where we have to think differently about something because we're already doing what's impossible. So whether you're working on a genetic condition that can't be touched, just have a nice life and then die, or whether you're working on a psoas that's been tight for 15 years and everybody has said this, that's just how it is. You're already doing the impossible. And we end up having to think through it. So because of Kate Adams, when she worked on me and my tight psoas, she ran scarring in the ureter and my psoas relaxed for the first time in 40 years. And now you all know how to do that. Working on genetic conditions is one thing, but the concept of increasing descending inhibition is one that nobody else has because nobody else can do it. So if you're going to relax spasticity, what do you need? GABA because that's the neurotransmitter that relaxes muscles. If you need to increase muscle strength, what do you need? Dopamine and acetylcholine. Those two, and I'm not an expert in that. I borrow experts like Dr. Delica, and then we get him on tape, and then the whole tribe knows. That was pretty fun. All right, Any, there's gotta be more questions. I'm not sure I can think of things because we've got 30 more minutes, you guys. Jennifer, yay. If you could answer or explain the logical thought of the neuro exam, I would love it. I know how to do the neuro exam, but I don't really understand what the findings tell you in respect to what to run for my, what a great question. From the podcast, I understand if you have a hyperactive reflex in the knee, Probably a problem in the C-spine. Could be thoracics too. What if it's hypo? Good question. If sensory is icky, it's a disc or a traction injury, right? Decreased motor. If sensory, yeah. Okay. Just to give you a heads up, that is pretty much a whole quarter's course. in physical medicine. And from an FSM perspective, for example, I had a patient in this week that had an auto accident last year, almost a year ago. She's fused at five, six, and six, seven. She's been seen by a chiropractor who adjusted her with an activator while she was laying on her face in a year after a 25 mile an hour rear end collision on a lady in her 70s who's already had a 5667 six, fusion, nobody had done the pinwheel exam or checked her reflexes. So that was fun. So we checked the sensation and she had some that were icky, um, mostly up on the shoulders. So if you have five, six, and six, seven fused, and then let's say you get rear-ended, good chance you're going to have a disc bulge at four, five. So you know the supine cervical practicum? So you have the, the set joints jammed and stuck in the upper C-spine. Back to the neuro exam. So the first thing you do is reflexes, patellar reflexes. Normal is a plus two. Plus one is when it's just a little bop, a little bit reduced, just a little twitch in the foot. And that can be from a number of things. One is a peripheral nerve problem. 
So you can have a reduced reflux if there's a disc bulge in the nerve, in this case, L3 at the knee. That's one reason it's a plus one. The other reason it's a plus one is if somebody is highly trained for fast twitch muscles. So let's say they play racquetball. So you have a healthy 28 year old, no history of neck trauma, and he's just no history of auto accidents or falls or anything major. And he's just there to get his neck and shoulder treated because he did something weird to his shoulder. And you do his patellar reflexes and his Achilles reflexes, and they're a plus one. So they're reduced in a 29 year old. Okay, why would that be? When you play a sport like, let's say, racquetball across maybe even soccer, you have fast twitch muscles and slow twitch muscles. Fast twitch muscles are more pronounced in younger people. And when they play a sport that requires them to use the fast twitch muscles a lot, so they're fast twitch muscles are really fast and really conditioned. What happens is the muscle contraction beats the reflex arc. It's faster than the reflex arc. So you strike the patellar tendon and before the reflex arc can get to the quadriceps and make the quads contract, the fast twitch muscles beat the speed of the nerves. That's the way Dr. Graham explained it to me when we had patients with a plus one who shouldn't have a plus one. A plus one is normal in the lower extremities in anybody over 60. So it's the only thing I remember from geriatrics from school is that in somebody over the age of 60, it is abnormal to have an Achilles reflex or a patellar reflex. You can have a patellar reflex of a plus one or a plus two. It's, those are the first ones you lose. And I can't remember why, I just remember that's a thing. So if you have a plus two normal reflex or a plus three hyperactive reflex in somebody that's 65, that's not normal. It's a normal reflex but it's not normal for a 65 year old. I hope that's making sense. So then the upper reflexes, C5-6, the biceps, brachioradialis, then the triceps. And so you can tell from the reflexes and the upper, if an upper reflex is hyper, like the muscle really goes wow, then you look for a disc bulge that's above that level. If the biceps reflex, C5, is really hyper, then you're going to look for a disc bulge at C4, just above the level of that disc. Okay, I'm going back to the questions. All right, then, so now you have the reflex part of the exam. And believe it or not, that takes about three minutes, four minutes to do, and one minute to write it down on your exam sheet. And then the sensory exam, you just have your little stripey guy, and you tell the patient this j should just feel sharp, prickly. Yeah, okay, prickly. And then there's also dull or reduced loss, and there's icky. And they almost always go, what's icky? You'll know icky when I get there. And so you go down all of the dermatomes. C6 is here and your thumb and your forearm. C5 is your upper arm. C4 is the point of the shoulder. C3 is here. C2 is here. C2 is also the back of the head. So somebody says they've had a headache every day for the last two years. Check the C2 nerve. Check the thoracics. So you just run it down the back. If you, anything in the back is either numb or icky, then you 
check the front, and then you check the nerves and legs, check marks on the little stripy guy. And 40 and 396 is what quiets down a hypersensitive nerve. And it's also what quiets, brings up a numb nerve. You have to reduce the inflammation before you increase the secretion. Decreased motor function is the more difficult thing. That's 81 and 396. So increased secretions of what? Acetylcholine and dopamine. The thing to remember with postmenopausal females is that testosterone increases dopamine. So if they're not on hormone replacement and they're having trouble with motor function, you might want to think of not only tyrosine and theanine, but also just a little bit of topical testosterone would be a good thing. Scar tissue in a nerve can make the nerve feel icky. So that's scarring in the nerve, right? And when you find a nerve that's not normal, you have to look at what caused it. That's where you ask the history questions. What happened? I fell. How did you fall? So if they fell with their neck and their trunk in flexion, that could be a disc. If they fell in such a way that they tractioned the brachial plexus, that's a traction injury. That's just 40 and 396. Quiet the inflammation in the nerve. And you don't have to worry most of the time about the disc. But that's where you combine normal knee reflexes with hypersensitivity or numbness in a nerve. Normal knee reflexes means it's not the disc because it's not irritating the spinal cord or slowing the descending inhibition of the reflex, right? Disc. The reason you have a hyperactive patellar reflex is the inflammation in the disc slows the descending reflex inhibition. So if it's not a disc, but they have numbness, then you look at the mechanism of action, pretty good chance it's a nerve traction injury, right? Or the disc is straight lateral and it's just irritating the nerve and not the spinal cord. And if things go well, usually you can pretty much tell what the MRI is going to look like by a combination of the reflexes, the sensory exam, range of motion, and the mechanism of injury. How did you fall? What kind of car were you in? Which way was your head turned? When you got hit, what hit you? And how fast was he going? So that's all in the core. And I am sure there's somebody someplace on YouTube that goes through a physical exam. Ron LaFay taught our class, and that man could do central nervous system and a peripheral exam complete in about 17 minutes. It was intimidating. All right, Jennifer, I hope that was helpful and not too much information. Why do we put contacts in specific places since current flows through the whole body? The current does flow through the whole body, but I like to localize the current at the place of injury. Does that make sense? So when you're treating from somebody's shoulder, right? You've got your fingers in their armpit. You want to have contact around their neck and a contact in their axilla to reduce the tenderness in the subscapular nerve. There are times when you need to localize the current. I had a patient in this week who has MCAS and it was really easy to treat. She listed her itching as a six. I ran from neck to feet, nine, allergy reaction in the blood, and her itching went to zero in something under two minutes. That's the current and the frequencies in her whole body, right? Does the current and voltage decrease due to higher resistance if you run head to toe? Probably. 
I would say the current, the volt, yeah, voltage is current times resistance. If you increase resistance, you're going to have to increase the voltage. But you really do have to localize the current when you're treating specific areas. Because the current increases ATP, why not give it just to the liver? If you're treating the liver, why not give it just to the small bowel? So the lady with MCAS, both times she came in, I ran torn and broken or leaky gut, torn and broken in the small intestine plus inflammation and put the current, put the contacts under her back and across the abdomen so that we have a concentration of current locally. You could run it neck to feet, but why would you do that? You want to treat the gut. Also, because I use multiple machines and treat multiple areas, I like to try and keep from getting confused. So I want to localize the current where I'm treating. If the current flows anywhere also from the neck to treat the brain, why does it matter? We never run it through the brain. This is true. If somebody has a vestibular injury and you put the gloves under their thighs, you can make them dizzy with 94 and 94. We know that the frequencies resonate with what they're supposed to resonate with, but I still localize the current. I have one associate who just didn't want to have to think, I think. So she treated everybody in a recliner and she ran everything from neck to feet. And her results just weren't quite what they could have been. And I think it's because she didn't want to think where the nerve starts to where the nerve ends. If you're treating somebody's kidney, you know, somebody's psoas and your artery, contact under the back, contact over the muscle. And maybe some of that is real, like localizing the current. And maybe some of it is so the patient understands what you're trying to do, right? All right. Is it Anya? We don't treat cancer. I get it. Good. Nobody can ever give me the answer to the most basic question. Is inflammation in cancer the reason for the cancerous overgrowth or is its result? I don't know. We know that metastasis is inflammatory. We know that now is the cancer itself inflammatory or is the immune system attacking the cancer the reason for the inflammation? Turning off the inflammation help the patient heal? Mm, I wouldn't think so because the immune system is attacking the cancer and thereby creating inflammation. Or will it help to kill the cancer kill the patient faster? That's one way to put it. Uh, we do immune support, which includes 40 and 116 but it also includes increased secretions in the immune system. Is inflammation the controlling mechanism to limit the tumor or the reason for the tumor growth in the first place? That's a good question. I don't know enough. There must be an oncologist in our group. I don't know enough about how cancer works. My understanding is that cancer creates inflammation, but whether the cancer itself is inflammatory or whether inflammation is involved because the immune system attacks the cancer and inflammation is the immune system's major tool for fighting any infection or cancer? I don't know. It's a good question. And what we do know is that the immune suppressants like Humira, that whole class of immuno that they use for autoimmune disease. The warnings on those is that when you reduce TNF-alpha or any one of the cytokines specifically, you have an increased risk of cancer and infection. So patients who are on long-term or high-dose immune suppressants have a definite increase in the risk of cancer and infection. So inflammation is what the immune system used to fight those guys. Okay, how would you treat loss of sense of smell from COVID? So far, that's pretty easy. 
you take the COVID frequencies, those six viruses, 38, 41, 44, 56, 160, 189, and you think about the sense of smell. Where does it come from? Ethmoid sinus. You can look it up in Never. There's an ethmoid sinus, and it's got a little ethmoid plate that's got these little nerves or hair cells. And there's a bed of tiny capillaries. And so you run the viruses and the capillaries, and you run the viruses in the ethmoid sinus. You can run viruses in the cortex, and you put a washcloth over the forehead, over the ethmoid sinus. I can't remember if I put the other one behind the neck or under the chin, probably behind the neck. And so far, I think six for six. I've never had it not work, which always makes me nervous. Patient went from not being able to smell anything or everything smelled like burnt onions and cigar smoke. So she had parosmia. And at the end of the treatment, she could smell the lavender hand lotion that she brought. She smelled her hands and went, and smell the lavender. And it doesn't smell like burnt onions or cigar smoke. That's how I treat the loss of sense of smell. Explain further C2 and the headache. Thank you, Louise. I love the C2 headache. So the C2 nerve root, if you look on the stripey guy, the dermatome map, comes under the jaw right here. And then it is the occipital nerve goes up the back of the head. It's like a hand. That's what it looks like. There's a bunch of branches go from just between C1 up the back of the head. If you run a pinwheel down that and it's now, that's the patient that says, I've had a migraine every day for two years. Okay, the first thing is you need to tell the patient, yes, I understand. Although I have to tell you, nobody has a migraine for two years. So let's look into this. And then you run the pinwheel down the back of their head and nobody has ever checked that nerve root except you guys, because we have a way to treat it. A C2 nerve headache is nerve pain. If you've ever had nerve pain in your hand, aches, hurts, drives you crazy. The C2 nerve root gives you a headache that drives you crazy. It's nerve pain in the back of your head. It stops right here across, right between your ears. And you put a towel around the neck where the C2 nerve root starts. You part the patient's hair and you put a washcloth between the ears like that. And you run 40 and 396. And pretty soon, and you take your poke wheel and you check because the normal nerve will be hypersensitive or numb, but hypersensitive usually. And you run 40 and 396 up the back of the head until the pain is gone. How's your headache? I think it's gone. It's very centralized. So you have to run 40 and 89 to quiet down the brain. And then there's usually scar tissue in the nerve at the very base of the skull because the C2 nerve root runs in between layers of fascia and adipose. If you remember your cadaver, the adipose at the base of the skull is so thick that it's in dense adipose and fascia. So scarring in the fascia, scarring in the nerve, sclerosis in the adipose, and that's after you've gotten the nerve to quiet down. Debbie, the way you explain the neuro exam is so helpful and makes so much sense. Yay! When it makes sense, you remember it. I get to be crazy Aunt Carol. That would be me. Jennifer, you're welcome. I'm glad it's making sense now. Louise, wet towel in front of the neck. Does that affect the thyroid? No. What if one has undiagnosed Hashimoto's? Uh, won't make any difference unless you're treating the thyroid for some reason. And even then, I'm not sure we can do anything. In the hot phase of Hashimoto's where the thyroid is hyper, you can run reduce inflammation in the thyroid, and that will help the heart rate come down and quiet it down. It's You still have to figure out why the immune system has decided your thyroid belongs to somebody else. That's a whole nother 
conversation, but the current isn't going to do anything to undiagnosed Hashimoto's. Oh, Louise, can you repeat? Bumblebee Christmas tree, red and green are positive. Oh, that's the last one. Yeah, all right. So Kathleen, if intending to run a frequency pair for 60 minutes, can equivalent efficacy be obtained by running the frequency pair on two different machines for 30 minutes? The answer is maybe. Some people have talked about doing that with 81 and 10 and 40 and 10. It's just 60 minutes is what it takes. 124 for 30 minutes, twice a day, equivalent in effect to running 124 for 60 minutes once a day, maybe. So here's the thing, 124 is torn and broken. And let's say you're treating a partial thickness tear in one of the external rotators in the shoulder. And you run it for 30 minutes, you make some headway in repairing that muscle. But then the patient goes out and uses it all day. And then you treat it again for another 30 minutes later in the day. And by then it's broken some more. So you may end up doing reruns if you're treating it 30 minutes twice a day instead of 60 minutes once a day. 124 is one of those time dependent things and even 60 minutes is no guarantee that it's going to be a one visit fix, or as Kim would say, one and done, because they need tape to support the muscle. That's kinesio tape rather than rock tape. And I don't know much about kinesio tape. So every case is different. I don't know. It's like making soup. Have you ever made soup where two batches were the same at one time? It's especially when it's torn and broken, if it's a partial thickness tear. And the fact that Kathleen Casbin was able to fix my 11-month-old Achilles tendinopathy in 60 minutes using 124 and 191 for 60 minutes. I don't think it would have worked if she ran it for 30 minutes because I would get up and walk on it and tear it again. There's something that you just got to do what you got to do. Same thing with 40 and 10 patients. 40 and 10 patients, they don't get down to a one for 60 minutes. That just, I don't know why it works that way. But 40 and 10, I, I had an associate that staying on time was really important to her. And that's when we were first treating fibromyalgia patients. So she treated them for 30 minutes and they left with their pain at a four. And she never had a fibromyalgia practice because it didn't work. They leave it a one at 60 minutes. Louise, Christmas tree at the pain area. No, nope. Christmas tree where the nerve comes out. Bumblebee at the end of the nerve root. Debbie, I'm glad you enjoy the podcast. It's really fun doing them. And you ask good questions. And that makes me happy because when you're asking good questions, that means you're thinking and thinking is what we're about. So Debbie Menden, would it make a huge difference if you didn't do red cross black? If you're using sticky pads, yeah, I'm afraid it does because I had a chiropractic assistant that did not get the whole Christmas tree bumblebee. The red had to be kitty corner from the black. And the Red Cross Black only applies when you're using adhesive pads. If you're using wet towels, the frequency and the current mix inside the wet towel, apparently. And if you're using sticky pads, they have to cross. So when I was treating my shoulder fracture, I had the red and green up here where the nerves came out. And I had the black and yellow down here just below where the fracture was. And I use sticky pads and they had to cross, which is tricky when you're going from the neck to the elbow. Wow. Is it four o'clock already? We got two minutes. What else can I talk about? Oh, I know. Two minutes. I finally filled out the form online with my lawyer's help. Thank you. For the American Academy of Resonance Medicine, a non 501c3 nonprofit association where 
the purpose is to support research and patient care using resonance therapies or frequency specific microcurrent, red and yellow. No, it's red and green, Christmas tree. I don't know what the Chinese devices, I know they have an orange and a blue and a green. It's, you're on your own if you're using the Chinese, but the American devices that PDI sells are red and green are positive and black and yellow are negative. And the red and the black are one channel and the green and the yellow are the other channel. So anyway, I'm pretty excited about the American Academy of Residence Medicine. We'll find out how that goes when I hear back from the IRS. What else am I supposed to tell them about? There's a two-day practicum in Trapdale in April. There's a five-day core in Troutdale in May. We have the master class in Hawaii in the middle of August. And a master class is really fun because it goes from nine in the morning to one in the afternoon and there's no script. It's somebody said, what do we talk about? So it's a master class. It's whatever you need. It's completely individualized and whatever you personally need to feel mastery in any area of FSM that you practice. So if you're an internist or a physical therapist or a physical medicine and rehab or an acupuncturist or massage therapist or a naturopath or nurse practitioner, what do you need to feel mastery? That's what the master class is about. All things going well will be in Poland and Rome in September. And then we'll back in the in Troutdale in October, November, December. So it's an action-packed, fun-filled year. And yes, I know. I'm so excited. Precision Distributing has added a time waiver to our product line and the Mag Healy. So those are coming. We're not quite there with the instructions and the user manual and all the the customer support that we're used to for the other devices. So be patient with that, but those are coming. And I think, yay, now it's 4.02. We are late leaving, which is pretty usual for us. Kim always is so good at coming up with this closing line. And yeah, I'm not there today. I guess my mom, everybody does the best they can at the time with what they've got. When you look back at what you did this week and you learn something this week because it didn't go as well as you thought it might, then everybody does the best they can at the time with what they got. So learn more, do good things, and have a great weekend. And we'll see you next Wednesday. Bye. Thanks for being here. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.